it, it's one thing to kind of, you know, try some songs out and stuff in, in front of some friends and, you know, small kind of crowd, but you know, some of the places we played were pretty big and there was a lot of people there. So it, I'm just, I found myself just standing there looking at a sea of people with no one else on stage, but me. And, uh, I was like, please God, somebody give me some whiskey to numb the pain. <laughs> like fast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of 2020. I'm Corey Paisley here as always with Siobhan and Ben, and uh, we're super pumped to welcome back for part two, Keith Wallen of Breaking Benjamin, Adelita's Way, and uh, his own solo project, which we dive into quite a bit in this episode. Yeah, Keith is a great guy. He's so, so inspiring and always has some great insight on living the life of a musician and just creating. So it was really yeah. great to get a little bit deeper into some of his songwriting, getting into Breaking Ben, his experience with ups and downs of the music industry. Like holding that Grammy in his, he like holding that Grammy in his hand, like that's a crazy story. Like you know when he got, he finally got to hold that Grammy. You know, yeah, we'll leave that a mystery for those who choose to listen. <laughs> so without further ado, like and subscribe two zero two zero dash d dot com. Check out part two right now with Keith Wallen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 2020. I'm Siobhan Cronin here on time this week because I had a mishap in the last episode, which we can talk about. Um, but I'm here again with Benny Goodman and Corey Peza, and I am so excited for part two with the amazing Keith Wallen, who I was on tour with with Breaking Ben. Um, Woo! A couple of weeks ago, he's about to depart on a solo tour. Incredibly, incredibly great musician, super nice person. We talked about some amazing things in part one. So stick around. This is part two. Can't wait to dive in some more. Yeah. Thanks for coming back, man. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. Have you gone viral yet? Has it happened? <laughs> you know, uh, no. It, it may have happened in part one by the time this is coming out. So you never <laughs> know. Have. You, have a, you have a week from part one to figure that out. <laughs> may have, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we were talking a little bit, uh, you know, in in the break here uh, about <laughs> some 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 of the, the fun aspects of touring, and uh, you know, one thing that that came up in in um, our episode a couple weeks back with with Brock uh, was the uh, the Star Set uh, bus fiasco. And so, uh, Siobhan, why don't you just give a quick little recap to to fill in uh, our, our listeners this week? And, uh, oh, yeah, and, then, so and then I think we can share some some more stories between the two of you in that aspect. Yeah. So, well, yeah, we were talking about how unglamorous touring can be sometimes. And yeah, this tour for us. So, you know, we've got two buses for our camp and then also uh, Red, who's opening for us. They have a bus. But just us alone, the number of times we've had to have the bus fixed or stop in a shop. There was one day that I woke up and I'm like, oh, yeah, we're in the you know, nice day off. I'm excited to go like walk around, get some coffee. And I wake up and we're somewhere literally where there's no service in the middle of Alabama. And I'm like, where are we? We're at some random truck stop because the bus overheated or something's got to get fixed. But this week we had to take everybody off the other bus. All the crew put them on our bus for a 22 hour drive from Phoenix to Wichita, Kansas, because the other bus had to stay there, get fixed and then make it up and meet us in like the next city. So we all were just sitting. I was saying like this, like sardines, just upright for an entire day. Like Can we correct disgusting. something? Sure. You're in a band with two buses. So she doesn't just have a bus, Keith. She has two buses. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to, if you listen to the previous well, episode. Keith, though, we, we, like ben has multiple buses too. Well, yeah, because he's in a huge band because he's been fucking working it since the dawn of time. <laughs> he deserves it. Well, this is to say that it may sound glamorous to have a bus, but you also have to deal with the baggage of having a bus or more than one bus, because especially yeah. if one of the two breaks down and you've got 12 people on that bus, those people are coming with you. <laughs> so you better oh make God. room. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, big, uh, nice luxury buses until something breaks on them and then you're just in a rolling oven or, <laughs> yeah. you know, or worse. <laughs> it's, it's so it's so true. Yeah, but I mean, even like, you know, aside from us, Red's bus broke down also somewhere in the desert and they had to miss a couple shows, oh, you know, because I mean, luckily for us, you know, Ron and Dustin, they they know how to handle the buses. Ron, especially, he's almost like a mechanic at this point. Right. If something breaks down, he's of course in he is. with his hands up in the engine yeah. cover and oil, whatever. So, I mean, we've got that luxury of him having the experience, but some guys, you know, they even if they own the bus, like you need a special mechanic to work on these things. You never know what the problem is. It could seem like one thing and it's another thing. So it takes 
I know. love how fiercely uh, self-managed <laughs> Star said is. They're like, no, we're not going to hire a mechanic. Ron, get in there. Like, come on, let's yeah, get the, We said Ron come on, for two weeks to get certified. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th- you really have to be because you just can't trust anybody to fix anything right. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, that's another Uh, thing, too. I mean, these things have been fixed multiple times. And a lot of the times comes down to like, oh, they said they did this, but this still isn't working or they they didn't have enough integrity. And, you know, what they were doing is, yeah, it it happens all the time. Keith, can you talk a little bit maybe about some previous experiences uh, on the road that people might not uh, fully appreciate the uh, the trials that that often happen to a touring (laughs) band? (laughs) I mean, uh, you know, it's. I try not to complain. I try oh, not, not to complain. We're, we're sharing. We're, um, we're lifting the veil. We're I know. Not, yeah, it's not a complaint. Yeah, sorry. Uh, before, I you're bitchy. illuminating. <laughs> before I the give glamorous. the medicine, before I give the medicine, just sprinkle a little sugar there beforehand. Uh, yeah, it's uh, there's there's you know you're away. You're away. I mean that's probably the 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 hardest part. You're away from friends. You're away from family. Um, so that that can take a toll. Um, and uh, you know, there's times when, you know, you're sick and you're just like, oh man, you know, it's, it's one thing to just be like, man, I'm sick. I'm not going to go into the office today. It's, it's another thing to be like, oh, I'm sick. I still have to play a show today. You know? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's tough, you know, especially food poisoning, like Siobhan, uh, we know all about this, you know, we played this show uh, in, in Mohican sun or, I think yeah. that was where it was somewhere along oh, the yeah. line. We don't, we don't know it. when it happened. We don't know when it happened, but everybody somewhere along the lines got food poisoning. And, uh, you know, and it's just like everyone had a day off from hell. And I was like, how was your day off? Ugh, not too good. You know, everybody <laughs> said that. And, you know, including myself. I mean, it was it was horrible. So that kind of stuff just happens. And you're just out there, you know, in a hotel, you know, just like you know, ain't nobody taking care of you. Although my tour manager did, did like bring me up some like Theraflu and some Pedialyte. So thank you, Jerome, for that. That was very sweet. You to do yes, that. Jerome. I'm like, well, for the, for the left, win, for the save. Yeah. <laughs> she had left the show with me and Cindy, my fiance, and came back and she's like, I don't feel very well. I'm like, you're, you'll be fine. And she's like, I really don't feel. I'm like, and she had to get on a plane. She was going to fly back. And I'm like, are you sure you're okay to get on a plane? And you're like, I think, I think I'll be fine. I'm like, she's good. I, I didn't think I'd ever hear from you again. It was, it was pretty bleak. I'll say, yeah, that was, I hadn't been super sick on a tour in a long time, but you're right. I mean, it's like you, what do you do if there's a show, you know, I, you just have to somehow muster your way through it. I mean, Dustin got sick on, on this headline tour. He got some sort of laryngitis or something. And he had to like, do everything in his power to possibly be ready to make it through an hour, 40 minute set, you know? And it just is what it is because especially now so many people have been canceled on because of COVID a lot of the show dates that we had out West. It's like these people have waited like two times rescheduling for us to come back. So what are you going to do? Say, sorry, I'm sick. I can't do the show, you know? wait another right. year and a half for us to come back. I, I mean, can tell sucks. you, you can be like Justin Bieber who has to actually have his face paralyzed and go on the internet. Did you see this? I the know. poor, the I poor kid. Like, I, 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 it's really bad. I'm not even making fun of it. The poor kid got some virus and it manifested by causing some sort of palsy where half of his face is completely paralyzed. And he basically went on to his Facebook or his Twitter or whatever, the, whatever those kids use nowadays and was pretty much like, sorry, guys, as he's talking with only half of his face working, I can't do the shows. I didn't want you to think I was canceling on you for no reason. Like he's like actually you could tell he's upset that he has to tell people he's canceling. Meanwhile, half of his he's like I'm working out my face and that's like I I give him props because yeah, I that's, can imagine that's going to be the hardest decision no matter the, no matter the level. I mean, like, you know, obviously Bieber is just this whole force, but like, you know, to to say like the decision I'm making right now is going to affect tens of thousands of people is is oh, yeah. gonna weigh really heavy and, and then but you also have to weigh you know the, like we said with dustin like you got to make sure you're not going to do so much damage to yourself that mm-hmm. you are going to cause a longer you know kind of issue so that's that's tough sure. i definitely have all the respect in the world for being able to to handle that and manage it and move forward yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah it's uh you think about that you know you just uh, you know, you want to be, plus you want to be at your best and given a hundred, hundred percent, you know, 
the best show possible, especially yeah. after just, you know, coming back from this whole pandemic thing, you know, it's like, like, like Siobhan said, some people have been waiting, you know, I, I still, I, I don't think we've been out to the West coast since before, uh, this whole thing started. So yeah, I can definitely, uh, empathize with that. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about you touring with Ben, you, you know, you referenced it at kind of at the end of the last episode, but, um, how, you know, how did you end up getting into the band and what was that like? Because you talked about doing sort of an audition tape for anyone that didn't listen, um, in part one, you know, and then you didn't hear anything for a while and we kind of changed, changed gears. So can mm-hmm. we talk a little bit about what the denouement was in that situation? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, sent in some videos to, uh, and, you know, I, I, I talked to Ben afterwards and, and, and he was like, man, these are great. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. And I'm like, okay, cool. And, um, and I didn't hear back. So I went and got a job worked, uh, just, you know, still working on me. I, I wrote like a, a, a solo EP and, uh, you know, still trying to stay active with the music part of everything. And, um, and then, uh, Jason, our other guitar player called me, which I had known before, uh, breaking band. Like we had, we had done some writing and some work before. Um, and he hit me up he's like, Hey man, uh, would you ever consider joining another band? I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, if it's, you know, the right kind of thing, he was just like, well, uh, the band's breaking Benjamin. Um, uh, and you know, I think I'm going to be playing lead guitar and they need like a rhythm guitar players player and backup vocalist. And I'm like, ah. Oh. I was like, but that's what I do anyway. I mean, I feel like I could do that. I'm not really a lead player, so that'd be perfect. And I was like, I actually, I already talked to Ben and, and, uh, he was just like, yeah, man. Um, you know, I think they want to fly us out and we, we, you know, get in person and do like an audition. And so, so that, that was that, uh, we, I flew down to Nashville and me and Jason drove up there and auditioned and played with the rest of the dudes. And, um, you know, it went cool. It went good. You know, um, still didn't know for sure if I had the job until a, 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 a little while after that, but you know, we had, we had come back and forth a few times. And then at one point we were there for probably like six weeks just rehearsing. And, and at that point I was like, I think I've got the job. If I'm like, <laughs> did, did, <laughs> they think you, did they think you would just kind of figure it out? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. It's like, as soon as, you That's know, some serious passive aggressivity, man. <laughs> yeah. Like, how long like, can we push this guy? Like, could you imagine after that Ben walks in like five and a half weeks in, like go meet here's, here's uh Paul Gilbert. He's going to be playing lead guitar. Like yeah. <laughs> bye yeah. guys. Like they learned yeah. the whole set. They watched you through the window. It's a double glass window. You can't see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't know, you know, it's still kind of, you know, you're still kind of feeling people out. You don't know how people are. Um, but no, it was, it was cool. I, I call that time of, of my life. That was breaking Benjamin boot camp Cause we mm-hmm. just learned so many songs, so many lyrics, so many parts, all that. And, uh, and then, you know, we booked a show there in, in, uh, Pennsylvania for the first couple comeback shows. And, um, but it was great. It was great. I mean, it was such a, a an amazing opportunity. It was such an amazing um, just family and fan base to to be welcomed into. Uh, ben especially. I mean, he's he's so awesome. And and you know, we I w- I felt like I was in the band for like five minutes. It felt like, and and you know, he was already kind of like asking us to contribute to like writing and stuff. So I was like, man, that's amazing. Um, and he, he does not need any help, you know, writing. He's he's written some amazing songs in, in his time. So so it was such an honor. Uh, and like I said, all the fans were incredible and just welcoming. And uh, yeah, so it's been it's been a fast. You know, I, I, I think that I still consider myself kind of like one of the new guys, even though it's been like eight years is because it's just flown by so fast. And that's how I know it's great. And that's how I know it's been an amazing time because it's just been like a blink. So, um, but yeah, coming up on 10 years. So I'm, I'm not really a new guy anymore. Like you said, <laughs> no, that's amazing. I mean, can you, can you talk a little more about some of the rehearsals and, and preparing or even like talk about the first show, you know, after having done all this rehearsal, because I mean, I was in a similar position, way less music, I'm sure, but I joined Starset after two albums already existed and, you know, I'm playing violin parts, so I'm not really responsible for lyrics or anything, but you know, was it, was it, it must've been difficult to kind of internalize all of that and, and then go out and play a show. I mean, that's, that's a lot of work. 
Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, not only did uh, did you know we had to learn a lot of guitar parts, um, and myself especially, just like guitar parts and and little just you know little things and effects. You know, I went from basically being just a guitar player that plugs right into the amp, into the tuner, and just into the guitar, no effects, no anything. Mm-hmm. So now I'm in this band where there's all kinds of effects. There's wall pedals. There's you know there's filter pedals. There's all kinds of things, you know, I went from an analog amp to, you know, a digital, you know, Axe FX, uh thing. So it was, it, that was kind of an adjustment, but it was fun because there's a lot more digital toys to play with. So, so that was cool. Um, but the, the vocal parts of it, like one thing Ben really wanted to, to, to stress and really wanted to kind of bring to the table was uh, vocals, you know, having live harmonies, having live three-part harmonies, and also having the ability to, you know, if someone's voice is not doing too great, people can switch back and forth and kind of cover for each other. So it was just like three people singing all kinds of different parts. So I had to learn the lead part. I had to learn different harmony parts. I had to just be kind of prepared. And and that's happened. There's been times where, you know, somebody will be under the weather. I'll be under the weather sometimes, you know, the voice is not feeling great. You know, Aaron will kind of pick up some slack or if, or if Ben's just kind of like need a, like a hand here and there, you know, we all just kind of help, uh, help it go, help keep it going. Cause you know, you don't want to ever cancel ever. So, so I think that really helps us kind of have a little bit more longevity uh, out on tour. No, that's amazing. It's that that's, yeah, that's something that we learned, you know, I mean, multiple times, but on this tour, especially it's like, you know, having that ability and being rehearsed enough that you can cover for anything that might happen. It's so yeah. powerful, you know, because that's that's great to be able to support each can, other in that way. Can I ask a geeky question based on what you just said? Because I, I have a lot of guitar amps and stuff. And actually, uh, I have a, a guitar channel where the Kemper actually, it was one of the, the nicest things. They posted me a, a, as the uh, the video of, of the decade because I basically went in front of all my guitar amps and said, I don't need any of this because I have a Kemper. Because someone with a, because Corey actually came over one, and Axe Effects Kemper for me, it's like, it's not like a fight. They're both like the same yeah. kind of concept. It's like, Yep. AI at this point like it's talking back to you would you like a Marshall effect do you really want the brown sound yes Kemper just give me whatever you want because the thing is it's like I remember like the reason I didn't use any of those effects because at one time I did I had like one of those Furman pedals right with all the different stuff and you go in and it all just makes noise you're like what and then you're in the middle of a show and you're unplugging things you're like I don't know why so you just stop so eventually you're just like you know what doesn't make noise plugging into the amp and it still (laughs) makes noise and that was the reason when I first went through a a, a Kemper and I realized there literally is no noise not even on this filter thing not not unless I actually tell it to make noise yeah what was that like for you yeah the ass effects it was fun uh dude totally I mean exactly (laughs) what you were saying with with so much noise why yeah yeah well just back to just you know you know consistency and making sure that shit just works every night and every show. I mean, that was really, uh, you know, my whole thing with just going into an amp. I'm like, I know this is not going to, this is going to be okay. I mean, unless you just blow tubes or something, but, uh, and which happens, but still I was like, this is, and now there's a tube shortage. So look at you. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I got all my amps on my hard drive little, like right here, man. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. Fixed. I loved it. I loved it. Um, you know, it was intimidating a little bit. Cause I'm just like, God, look at all this stuff, you know, but, but it was fun <laughs> to, it was fun to like, listen to, you know, the intro of like one of our, we have a song called so cold and there's like a kind of a clean tone intro with delay. What's it called? Trying, I don't think I've ever heard that song. What was yeah. it again? No, <laughs> I, I never, I never assume that people have heard anything that you any want to know what's annoying about. is I I'm really ignorant. If you haven't noticed for most stuff, like I'll talk to people like, Oh, Steve Stevens, you were in Billy Idol's band. He's like, why do you have me on the show? Um, but like, <laughs> I know that song. So that means it, it matters. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty, but it's a very uh, yeah. distinct and recognizable tone. So yeah, it's, I would imagine from a it's mile away, so, yeah. dude. Yeah, it, but how could cool. you not it's, have heard that song if you were alive during that, like the last decade? <laughs> you never know. You never know. Uh, I got a, I got a cool Steve Stevens story actually. <laughs> Let's hear I love it. I went to Steve Stevens. He's the man. I love yeah, Steve. he is. He's awesome. So um, <laughs> I was at his his house in Hollywood one time. We were working on some music, just doing a, like a writing session, and uh, and his place is awesome. He's got a cool like layout studio and everything, and. Uh, 
I turned around and I was like, I saw a Grammy there. I was just like, dude, is that a Grammy? You know? And he's like, yeah. I was like, you know, I've never really seen or held a real Grammy. And I'm like, can I just like pick it up and like <laughs> hold it? <laughs> And he was just like, he's like, yeah, man. You know, and he's, he's got like a super just Brooklyn, New York accent. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, we had him on the show uh, a while back. He's great. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And he was just like, yeah, pick it up, bro. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, wow, this is awesome. And I was like, and then, you know, and he's like, yeah, I got that for the, uh, for Top Gun. Yeah. And I was like, this is so sick. Yeah. So the, the Top Gun theme, he got the Grammy for that. So, yeah. Well, when anyway, he came on yeah. the show, he likened like, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, they already had written it. Like, whatever I went in there. What what was his shit reference to getting a Grammy? Oh, yeah. Sometimes you just step in poop. That was his his like uh, analogy yeah, to the said. success of that. <laughs> he's like, I just yeah, walked was- in. I, st- I stepped in some poop and then, you know, <laughs> and then, it's like, and then it resulted in a Grammy. And it's like, dude. It, that guy's the real deal. You know what I mean? Right. Like he's the, re- and then of course you know he's like I toured w- with Van Halen, so like you know I, I'm okay guitars, but Danny Van Halen. So I just learned flamenco. Yeah, <laughs> fucking what so, a talented it, dude! I love. So that yeah, guy. I mean obviously that the the Grammy part of that story is awesome, but what about writing with Steve Stevens? Well, how did that come yeah. about? Yeah, how did that happen, dude? <laughs> oh, that was cool. No, um, it was uh, gosh, that came about through, um. Gosh, I hate just like name dropping. I don't want to drop should, any though. names. Oh, it's fine. Uh, it's, but that's it's cool. it just it just came about. It just came about through mutual <laughs> friends. Yeah. yeah, I'll stick to that. Did you bring <laughs> Billy Idol some cigarettes and, <laughs> and and a six pack of beer in the morning? And then after I, he threw his two dollars down, he was like, "Let me introduce you to Steve Stevens." <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I wish that would have been amazing. I would have. I would have stayed and drank and smoked with him. I'd been like, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome well let's maybe let's speaking of writing let's talk a bit about you writing and maybe even working on some of your solo stuff i mean it sounds like you've kind of been a writer all along internally perhaps and me as a, i don't really write any original music i can arrange but i don't ever come up with like an original song idea like complete on my own what's your process and you know how did you get started with that and you know what like how do you approach writing a song or even writing with someone else what's that like um it's you know i i tell people i mean there's really there's no rules of on how to do it you know it's you know i for me basically i just i start with just music first um and then i just kind of try to you know come up with some sort of melody that i think kind of sounds and feels right in there and then i just try to plug in the words afterwards um sometimes very rarely i'll have some sort of you know, phrase or words first and just kind of reverse engineer from there and just write the song around it. But, um, yeah, that's kind of my approach. Um, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) We've asked a lot of guests this, but when you're coming up with ideas, are you, are you like a voice memo guy? Are you like always like when you have one, do you have to like kind of get it down and then, uh, come back to, a whole pile of things to sort through, or are you just like kind of sitting down? Like, I'm writing now. I like, come up with something. I am. I am pretty much just like oh for like 400 on voice memos. Like I ch- I do make voice memos, and I'm like that's that, that's cool. I should record that. And then whenever whenever I go back to listen to it, I'm like that's trash. And <laughs> and I, I've never made a song from a voice memo yet. <laughs> so I don't know. All right. <laughs> I mean, then that means I guess it's working in terms of like you know vetting out the the stuff that's not going to yeah, make it. So <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's uh, that's my elimination process. Just make a voice memo. I'm like, I know not what I know what not to record. Well, I feel you on this because I don't. I, I, every voice memo I've ever made, I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea, and I'm just going to forget it, and then I never watch it, or I just don't fucking care. And if I yeah. have something that's cool, it's been in my hand for 20 years. I'm like, oh. That cool thing I played in like 1999. <laughs> that's for this. That's for this yeah. chorus. Plus, you I've been singing that forever because because you write shit all the time. But if it's really yeah. good, it comes back through your it, with alien limb syndrome. You're like, I know, and then you can yeah. all of a sudden play it again. Yeah. Plus, you listen to your voice memo, and it's like all out of context and everything else. You're you're like you're like in a bus, like uh, yeah, da, 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 da. you're like that's it. You know? So it's awful. Yeah. You talked about uh, you know how you know for the solo stuff, 
it, you're often it's just kind of you up there with the guitar, the singer songwriter stuff. But you know, I, I looked up a few things and it had the full the full production uh, on it. Where do you draw the line on that? Do you consider that two separate entities in terms of like the way you approach it, or do you always picture a full pr produced song when you're writing? Yeah, I think some of my earlier stuff, um, you know, I had an EP allies that was just basically just me and a piano and, and, um, that was pretty much just, I was limited by my own production skills at the time. So I was like, yeah, I'm not real good at the drum sounds right now. I'm just going to just keep it simple and, uh, not worry about drums or any other, other things. So that was really the reason for that. But I always, you know, I've always tried, you know, different stuff. I had a couple more, like kind of more alternative sounding songs, but through and through, I'm a rock guy. I was just finally, I'm just like, you know what? I'm just gonna go back to what I know, what I've, I've done the most of, and, um, you know, stick to the rock, the rock sound. And, and with that, you know, obviously, you know, I, I want to be able to kind of, uh, replicate that live, uh, with a full band. But, you know, I think for some of these first shows, it's kind of like, well, you know, let's just do the acoustic. Let's, let's just get out, get out there any capacity I can. Um, and so that's how it's been, you know, especially with some of these opening tours, you know, I opened, I, I opened for my own band, which was in December, which was that's just uh, smart though, that's which just was kind smart. of interesting. Yeah. I mean, it was a super amazing opportunity. I mean, it was so, uh, amazing of those dudes to, to, to be like, yeah, do it you know and they were so supportive you know the band the, the other band guys that, and, that's so. awesome dude i mean that, that's really cool because you know that james hetfield's like no eddie van halen <laughs> from the grave is like you can't do anything david <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it was it was super cool i mean i i got made fun of every night by ben but you know like so Worth how's it. it how's it feel to uh open for yourself you know that was that was, <laughs> was pretty much that every night but but no it was it was fun and it was it was uh super super uh learning uh you know uh it, it's one thing to kind of you know try some songs out and stuff in, in front of some friends and you know small kind of crowd but you know some of the places we played were pretty big and there was a lot of people there so it, i'm just i found myself just standing there looking at a sea of people with no one else on stage, but me. And, uh, I was like, please, God, somebody give me some whiskey to numb the pain. <laughs> like fast. That takes, that takes some balls, man. That's, that's well, incredible. Can, do you think that you could ever though? Cause you're a great performer. Like you're, I really enjoyed Thank watching you. you guys. Like you all move around. I was tired by like maybe about 17 seconds into the show. I'm like, ugh, <laughs> these guys, how do they do that? Like I hurt. You know what I mean? Like we talked to Gary Holt from Slayer. He's like, this arm's fucked. This arm's fucked. But my head, I could still bang it. It's like, so like, I'm like, I don't know how you fucking do it. I, I hurt just like getting to the show. But like, I, I just, I have to say, man, like it's really refreshing to hear some of these stories and also about the writing stuff and the fact that your band supports you. Like, I mean, I, I really hope that someone takes like a note from this, that like the best thing you could ever do for musicians in your band is let them be the best that they can be, even if that means supporting them on their own. And it's like, it's really nice to hear that because like, I mean, I know bands that I've been in that had zero success that were like, you can't do anything else. Like how we, we're a thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, um, which makes no sense to me because, you know, if, if all the members of a band are thriving and doing their thing, it, it only makes the band, I think, I don't know. Um, I think it just helps as a collective. I think it just helps kind of, um, you know, especially when there's, there's, you know, during COVID there's like nothing happening, you know, every, everybody was kind of doing their own thing. Um, so I'm like, well, I'm still doing something. So just trying to, Hey guys, just making sure you guys still remember, you know, us and me and whatever, you know. So I, I, I feel like it has to help somehow. So at least I hope so. I could oh, be wrong. Absolutely. I mean, it's just like keeping your chops up. If I went two years during COVID and didn't touch my violin, it would probably be a disaster. <laughs> but yeah, you just have to keep it going and it stay, you know, stay out there and 
exercise the creative muscle. Looking from the outside, sure. it seems like, you know, Breaking Benjamin in general, like that, just, it seems like a fun workplace, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know, the tour you guys talk about, you know, with Corey Lowry saying it's one of the best tours he's ever done. And, and us just seeing it, being in the audience, looking at that, being like, the, everyone on this stage looks like, they're like, they're, all the bands are friends. Everyone's having a good time. They're joking about it. It seems like a party, you know, rolling through this, the, this, the country as opposed to a tour. Um, and then to hear that, you know, he supports you in like doing the opening thing. It just seems like, you know, bands at that level, like it or not, are businesses. And, you know, if everyone's happy, the business thrives and, and the crowd can sense that. So it's, it's really cool to kind of hear that that's the approach and, and the atmosphere that you're, that you're working with for sure it's it's been amazing you know and i and i would never i would never want to do anything that would damage or diminish the breaking benjamin name or brand in any way ever uh and i think they all know that and you know um you know even even just you know uh when i played live solo i mean this the the shows are promoted as like keith wallen of breaking benjamin you know i would rather not that not be there but you know it, it just has to be there for now because uh that's just i don't know that's the way the promoters prefer uh but you know i want to i want to kind of make it on my own merit and uh you know i don't i don't want to be um i don't know for for lack of better words just um using that platform for my own benefit you know i i don't want to at all so and i think they all know that and 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 so it kind of helps. Uh, they know that I'm coming from a good place. And I think that helps the whole thing and helps them be supportive of it. So, yeah, it's absolutely. funny that well, you say that you, you don't know if you've it's like you're still talking like you haven't made it, which is like, why well, I also know that you're a lifer because this is like how because it's never going to be enough. You could be like in no. the Rolling Stones and you'd be like, well, <laughs> if this doesn't work out, I guess I'm just going to have to go try it again at 97. Like, never. I love that about you, man. Like the never surrender Corey Hart, man. Like that's you, bro. Dude, never. never. Surrender. I mean, it's, it's never, it'll never be enough. Honestly. Um, you know, the, <laughs> I know I keep going back <laughs> to this, but the time it was enough, I went on a houseboat and partied all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so call back to the first episode there. Yeah, I mean, you gotta go back, back and watch it if you haven't, or listen to it or whatever you do to consume this. <laughs> Hi yeah, mom. Yeah. Yeah, all comes back to the party boat. Well, let me let me ask you a question out of my own curiosity. Um, as let's say somebody that wants to get into songwriting or like you said, you know, you've always had the idea of sort of a full production in your head. But, you know, at the time you didn't have the production skills in your EP to, you know, do it all yourself. How do you go about, you know, putting something like that together? Because one thing I've learned from just observing Dustin and other songwriters, you know, I try to sit down and write stuff and I'm like, I can't do it. Like I can do some piano and violin. I'm not really a vocalist, but, you know, I, I notice that people work with a lot of other people in songwriting, you know, mm -hmm. so how do you, you know, when you have ideas, how did you go about approaching collaborating with other people or finding somebody that kind of has that expertise to help you like flesh out your ideas? Yeah, I think just the more the more times you do it, I mean, it's it's just like any other kind of uh, muscle or skill, you know, it just takes, you know, uh, repetition and practice, you know, I mean, I feel like the songs that I was writing when I was 18 are trash. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and the songs that I'm writing now, maybe they're a little bit less trash, but uh, I feel like I've, I've, I've grown as a songwriter and, um, you know, and plus you, you learn kind of like what you like and you learn what you're good at and, and, and how to kind of focus in on that and lean into that a little bit. Um, so I think that helps. I think just to answer your question, um, you know, write with as many people as you can and also just write by yourself, see what works best for you. Um, some people write better with other people, uh, some people, you know, by themselves. Um, yeah, I, I don't know where I'm at with that. I mean, I feel pretty comfortable by myself, but sometimes it's nice to have someone to, to bounce ideas off of and, 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 you know, bring stuff to the table. You know, there's always going to be a, a part or a time where you're just, you feel stuck with something. It's like, if I could just think of this one word, I can move on, you know, or I could just think of a better you know, verse melody or something, you know? Um, but 
I mean, I, I try all kinds of things. I mean, I sit there on a piano and, um, you know, try all kinds of different melodies and stuff that's weird, something that I wouldn't even try to, that sounds normal and you, you just never know, you know? So. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. I mean, when, when you get well, into Siobhan, it, is it, you know, go ahead. I was going to say, cause I, I want to say something very interesting because Siobhan doesn't consider herself a writer and we write together in Lost Symphony. And I find this amazing because I, I wrote, we did, we're working on a new song right now and I wrote this whole song, but I kept it basically just like piano chords and melody through the uh -huh. whole thing. And I sent it to her because I'm like, I want you to arrange a bunch of this. And it was like, if you have you seen the movie Amadeus? Like it's about Mozart. But the it's point is, is that like Mozart comes in and he makes fun of this guy because he's like, oh, that theme you just played and he plays like a million times better. I sent her my song with just like, you know, a one line thing with just the chords pulsing and uh -huh. what she did to it. Like if you didn't consider that like full blown composition, it's just amazing <laughs> that like she's like asking how to write a song. Whereas like I could win a Grammy <laughs> riding her coattails on her ability to take my bullshit theme. I just wrote on the piano chunking things along and she put ch multiple cellists to this and made it sound amazing by itself to the point where I had chills. Wow. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. That don't forget, just like in Amadeus, she added she added a layer of piano over yours. To <laughs> oh, she did, yeah. She not only did that, but she actually made some parts She's completely like unrecognizable <laughs> because once I actually said, here's what it is, she felt fine changing everything. You know, which That's is fine. Awesome. But like she just, she can't start it. So I'm gonna dovetail on what you said. Sticking to a structure. Just saying, hey, this is a verse, and I'm going to try that. Here's a chorus, I'm going to try that. And just chugging through that, and then seeing how that sounds. And that's the thing, is because you're just stifled with indecision. If you just say, yes. hey, here's the bullshit melody I'm starting with. Here's the second <laughs> bullshit chorus. Let's just put all this bullshit together oh, yeah. and then go, why is it bullshit for the next 20 years? It'll be awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That helps. That, that, that totally is good advice, because... You can get so precious and hung up on every little minute detail and you're not getting anywhere. So you just got to just kind of vomit it out <laughs> for lack yeah. of better words. No, no, that's, that's good advice because you're right. I mean, like for me personally, it's I can't start anything. It's, but if you give me even like a fragment of a melody, I'm like, all right, I can do something with that. But I just have such debilitating self-doubt that I'm like, I am not worthy of writing a melody. Well, that's what you need to do. <laughs> you know, like just like Paul Geary said on the show, um, you know, you, you gotta write a hundred songs before you get one that doesn't suck. So you got to start pumping them out, Shavad. You got to catch up. All right. All right. <laughs> just write a bunch my, of shitty songs. And then that's uh, my then post tour mission. Yeah. Well, and hand, here's myself. the other thing is, so I'll tell you something that Mariko, so she's the uh, incredible, incredible cellist that played with Starset back in the day. She now, like, uh, she's just absolutely amazing. Played with us. And I asked her if she could play on a song. And she goes, when are you releasing this? And I said, I don't know if I'm ever going to release this. And she wrote back to me. She goes, I appreciate your passion. <laughs> and I, like, that's how you know you're a songwriter. It's like, going, it seems no, a little man, passive it's aggressive. This, it, it's not. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But she, well, yeah. That yes, sounds like a no. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's, her, yeah. She's got her polite Japanese ways. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, she she actually she called me later and we we she, I'm telling you right now no she she appreciated that cuz I tell her I tell her all the time it will be released I just don't know when I have songs a plenty but that's how you become a songwriter you just you you have to have 300 songs and then even find a song and Corey and I have both done this where you find a complete song on your computer that you don't even remember doing that has all like the harmonies mm -hmm. and the parts and all that like that's how like that's how much you have to do it it's like you forget even your best stuff yeah, for Prince sure. is like that, I think. <laughs> yeah, we're just like Prince. It's, that's the thing. That guy. You have from to be that delusional. Band, Prince. Yeah. yeah, Prince. But, well, he was formerly of Breaking Benjamin, right? <laughs> formerly of like, is that what it was? Is that the formerly? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I don't so, know. Yeah. Well, well speaking know. of the man Prince, formerly known as. Speaking of Prince and touring, we played in a venue the other day. I'm trying to remember where, but you know, we were uh, in the dressing room, and Ron was like, "Hey, do you know why the walls are purple in this in this venue?" And I was like, "Oh, I don't know, because it's like kind of nice and chilly." He's like, "Because when Prince played here, that was his demand that he won't he'll only play if the place is painted purple, like the dressing room." Wow. And that that was a thing. I That's gotta, amazing. I think it was in Portland, That's, maybe. Like, I don't know. I'll have to look up the venue, but fun fact.
That's he awesome. played the Worcester Palladium, and he was a vegan, and he said he would not play unless they shut down all the meat stands on the street of Worcester, Massachusetts. So when I saw him on his musicology tour, or whatever the hell it was, there was no like late night street meat, which was the first. I don't think I've ever seen late night street meat in Worcester ever. <laughs> Everything closes by the time the show gets out. <laughs> yeah, this was this was in two thousand four. So yeah. there was, oh, like, back oh, in the heyday, yeah. yeah. life yeah, was yes. a different. Th it was a different world, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know you're you're getting ready to embark on the the solo tour, right? Like, uh, what's uh, what's the preparation look like for that? Well, uh, gosh, yeah, just me, just running through the songs in my basement basically <laughs> i wish i could i wish i could say there's this huge pre-production but no it's just me with a guitar just uh trying to remember all the words and all the chords and yeah that's it uh, i did although i did do a uh i did do kind of a i mean i wouldn't call it a secret show but i did play a show uh, a couple nights ago uh at one of my my friend's bars and a bunch of my friends came out and hung out and it was, it was, it was a fun time. It's kind of a, a live dress rehearsal. Uh, -huh. uh, but, uh, but yeah, other than that, just, you know, just running through it and, um, you know, getting used to singing for, you know, an hour. So right. I'll probably just sing it, sing the set so I can just be used to it, you know? Right. You said it, you open Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. So you said you opened for your band and that you were on stage and that it was like you needed whiskey to numb, you know, just being up there with the guitar and you because you're playing these huge venues. But I have to surmise that maybe in a fantasy of yours that it wouldn't be needing whiskey and that maybe you'll bask in that being a songwriter and that do you think you'll ever actually fully embrace the fact that maybe you could go one day and play where Breaking Benjamin, you play as the guitar player in that band, but by yourself? just a absolutely. guitar on a stage and do that and not feel uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not really, I'm, I'm not uncomfortable about the playing. Really. The whiskey is just for the talking in between songs. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, that's yeah. fair enough. That's, that's really, once the song starts, I'm right at home. I'm like, I feel fine, but it's the, mm -hmm. it's the talking. It's like, once the music stops, then it's just like, well, yeah, that's like just <laughs> crickets, you know? So, yeah. So it's, I mean, I can relate to that. That's I, I watch Justin, you know, from behind him every night and being a front man of whatever size thing you're doing is is yeah. a next level energy, you know, to to be able to maintain your the, you're like the MC of your own show. You know, you have to entertain the people, keep them, you know, watching and listening and yeah. active. And it's it's it, yeah, it's a skill. Yeah. The uh, really uh, I had I had. Uh, and the, the whiskey has just, you know, and look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like some crazy huge drinker by no means, but, uh, it just helps just enough so that, um, I'm a little more comfortable talking. Cause you know, no one ever tells you that, you know, Hey, when you, you when you play music and you get on stage and you're singing in between the songs, you're a public speaker, like you're giving a speech, you know, and not, not that you know, I have to, I have to, sit there and talk all night, but you know, you got to say a little something. I, I, I used to just be like, thanks. <laughs> Here's the next song, blah, 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 you know? And it was just like, I feel like if you say a little something, I think it enhances the show, you know, mm -hmm. um, well, that's a, the connect. That's a connection to the crowd right there. You know, exactly. It's, it gives you a little bit of back and forth. And, and sometimes amazing things like funny little special things happen. Like I had, I had, uh, I had a show in Dallas. This was opening for, for red in February. And, um, I, ha I kind of have like some long hair in the back here and somebody yelled, I like your mullet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't hear, I didn't hear the word mullet. I mean, I'm, I'm always just obsessed with food anyway, but my brain heard guacamole. So what? <laughs> yeah. it doesn't even my, sound the same. I just heard guacamole. Like we're earplugs. Uh, or, or someone said my mom loves your mullet or some, someone yeah. likes your mullet. And I just heard guacamole or something. And, and I was like, well, I, I just heard guacamole and I don't know why, but I fully support that. So everybody just yelled guacamole. And so every show after that, someone in the crowd yelled guacamole. Somehow they knew. And so it was, it was a funny so thing. Cute. It was awesome thing. Somebody gave me a shirt that 
said rock out with your guac out. So oh, yeah, that's my favorite shirt. You wore that on the last day of tour. And I saw that. I remember I said to Brock, I was like, I love his shirt. It's that so Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 how that came about. So, yeah, that's amazing. That's so funny. Phenomenal. <laughs> but yeah, if I had just been like my usual, just, you know, hiding from the world self artist guy, you know, I wouldn't have had to been like, I don't know what you said, but here's the next song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. you're you're realizing you're super you're you're becoming aware of your superpowers that you can be funny and that you can just do things on stage and that people are going to support you, which is really a nice thing. And I, when in doubt, what I would do is I'd go back to all those Kiss bootlegs from like the, the '70s and get like Paul Stanley and I just put it onto my phone and I just put it up to the microphone when you're in front of, in front of like ten thousand people. So like if it's like Detroit, <laughs> just find out like the Detroit concert and then just have Paul Stanley talking between and then continue playing your set to all serious. Dude, that's an amazing idea. I love that. I love that idea. Pre-record yourself. You know, just record yourself saying like. How you guys doing tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put the phone down all like yeah. ceremoniously, like walk yeah. back, take a sh drink of water and then like start playing casually. Yeah, yeah I love That'd it. Be, dude, if you did that, I swear to God, dude, if anyone did that at a show, like at that caliber, I would just like tip my hat. I, I'm doing honestly, it. Honestly, I'm going to I'm going to do it. Walk out with the walk out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. Well, can you talk about like with the upcoming tour? Um, you know, well, a couple of things. Uh, can you talk about like the types of venues you're playing, and also when you're preparing for it? You know, if you have some more full production songs, how are you sort of reverse engineering and figuring out how to reduce it to just guitar and vocals? Because that, that's a skill too. You know, it takes some time to figure out like what is the essential core of this song if I have to present it in a reduced form. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um, well, some of the, the most, mostly the venues are, are, are pretty small, you know um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a building, it's a building kind of thing. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't assume anyone's ever heard of me or heard of my music. So I, I want to just, you know, obviously I want to play to as many people as I can, but this is where I'm at right now. So, and I love it. I, I love the fact that it's, it's going to be kind of a more intimate kind of thing. Oh, that's, that's awesome. We did an acoustic tour like that. And I, I love doing that. We were just playing breweries and bars and you're right there with everyone. So it's, it's a great setting for that. Yeah. Gen -pop. I, I heard about that too. Uh, uh, Jerome said he, he went to one of those. He said it was amazing. And oh, awesome. that's, that's a super, that's a super cool idea. Um, so I'm, ex I'm excited. I mean, plus it's, it's acoustic, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of made for kind of a more of a smaller venue. So, but as far as, you know, kind of deconstructing kind of the songs down from full produced to acoustic. And it's not too, it's not too, too bad um, with my stuff. You know, my stuff's not too super complicated, you know, it's, it's pretty much just basic chords and, and uh, you know, so really the hardest thing is just, uh, well, the hardest thing at first was I had never played the songs live in any capacity before. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you kind of, um, you, you could, maybe probably relate to this, you know, you record the song in the studio and then you don't even think about it. And then when you, when the tour's coming, you're like, Oh, I got to like learn how to play that again. And like yeah. what I recorded, you know, like, so there, there's a lot of that in, in general, not even just deconstructing them, but just learning how to play it period. So, and then, <laughs> and then just, you know, remembering all the lyrics and all that stuff. So, but that's pretty much my, my prep just, just going through it basically just by myself and um, yeah, trying, trying to do it my, my best here by myself before in front of anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You doing any covers now? Cause that seems to be a theme. I do two covers. Uh, one of them is uh, the look by rock set, but it's my That's own it. kind of version of it. And then another cover is wicked game by Chris Isaac. Well, if you say it like rock set, that'd be a little bit weird. Because I don't feel like that's like in your realm exactly. So I'd like to hear it your way. I mean, as far as their physical voices, I'm just making a thing. Um, but Wicked Game. What made you choose Chris Isaac? Was it the video? Because I love that video. Um, I don't, you know, what made me choose that one? I think uh, in my, my earlier EP that I mentioned, um, I wasn't even thinking about that song or covering it or anything. I was messing around with just like a weird kind of, percussion drum sound 
And I was like, man, that kind of, that would be cool to kind of play this chord. And then I, I just kind of put it together. And I was like, that's wicked game. And then, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it was different. I was like, oh, I'll just cover this. And, and so, so yeah, I kind of accidentally fell into it. That's, that's funny. Amazing. Yeah. I, that, that, I mean, I haven't ever written a complete song, but I was noodling around one day and I like sent Brock this idea and I realized I'm like, Oh my God, this is Baba O'Reilly by the who the piano thing. Yeah. But I got to tell you, so I went and interviewed Carol Kay, the legendary bass player, like who, who wrote like, who's played on everything like since the dawn of time and she was saying oh yeah all all the guys in the 50s and the 60s they were just changing the standards and just putting different lyrics on them and calling them different things it's been since the dawn of time like that's the wicked game is that you wrote an awesome song that rem that reminded you of wicked game that you could have totally not had to pay chris isaac for any publishing for and you just gave him credit and just used his lyrics whereas yeah. really everything is just ripping off everything like you didn't copy the who the copy the who wrote there's three chords. They copied everyone else. <laughs> like that's yeah. the point. And they did it great. Like Pete Townsend took those three chords and made it something. And that's why the who was awesome. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting. Cause I mean, surely everything's been done by now mm -hmm. or progressions and, and all that stuff. And now, you know, song titles, everybody has the same song titles for things now. Uh, but you know, I don't know. What are we going to do? Yeah. I mean, we all use the same letters and the same notes on the piano. I mean, it's interesting yeah. if you follow some of like the lawsuits that have that have come up in the past few years too. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it, because music is kind of a foreign language to you know most people, and those are the people on the jury. It's a uh, it's a weird thing to to create legislation around it because you're. You know, people are like, this sounds like my song. And then the, mm -hmm. the lawyer has to go, up, well, technically, this note was, you know, a half step yeah. above this part. And the jury is like, what the hell are you talking about? It kind of sounds like it, you know. Um, yeah. And I think there's been a few cases where luckily they were able to prove that, like, listen, it's impossible to you can't say that this is your thing because it's it's so common. Uh, but yeah, with with like writing, uh, you know, any sort of creative endeavor, it's really hard to draw that line between what is, um, you know, inspired mm -hmm. or derivative and or, or what is exact copy. Um, but especially now, I like just think of there's probably a thousand songs going up on Spotify every minute. It, it might it's probably more than that, to be honest. And to think that there's 12 notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, in, in, in some in some cases, uh you know, the industry and fans rejoice when something sounds like something else from the past. Mm -hmm. And so I've never understood that. Uh, like all country music. <laughs> <laughs> Greta Van Fleet sounding like Zeppelin. They sound like, good. just there's a, there's, there's, there's like a band, but it, you know, you know what? Like, I hate it at, like, uh, as a curmudgeonly old man, but like inside my heart, it's like, but at least if like there's going to be a Drake song on the radio and then this rock tune just like busts it out like it's it sounds like zeppelin it's yeah cool. and that's the thing is zeppelin's not putting out new music someone's got to do something <laughs> exactly dude <laughs> yeah yeah it's like Tell Jimmy Page to know, write something plus rock you know any yeah. any kind of rock that gets out there i'm a fan of so yeah no agreed so who, who so for you now like in in the world like we lost taylor hawkins which was like a, such a bummer you know like, and i thought for a while, like Foo Fighters, like, you know, he even says this in this documentary because, you know, everyone, just like Mike Shinoda says, has to make a documentary. I mean, with the Foo Fighters, it's warrants a documentary in their case. But it's one of those things where he said that, oh, we were the token rock band for a long time. Like, they'd have on the Grammys, nothing. And then it's like rock represented by the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. Who do you think the bands that you see now are like representing rock and roll for you, like the most in your heart, like currently? Making mm. music out there now that mattered this moment current. I maybe I never heard of them because they came after Pantera. I'd say, I mean, I mean, I've never I've never been one to be able to really put my finger on the pulse of music for you. And, and, this is and a that, subjective yeah. question for, for me. For me, I would say uh, and this is a band that I just think is just great. Um and they consistently just put out stuff that just sounds fresh to me. Uh, bring me the horizon. Oh yeah. They're awesome. Um, yeah. You know, cause they, they, you know, 
they're they're just great with the hard rock but also just pop sensibility and melodies and everything and production too i mean it's really cool um i feel that way about a bunch muse of, i feel that way about muse oh you know, i love band, muse muse, muse yeah. is incredible. That, that's the same thing it's like because th- their newest single sounds like death metal and it's like, but then they have like a, a dubstep song and then it's like just wonderful piano that's Chopin. And it's like, yeah. and they can get away with that. And it's like, God, God bless that they can do that. Bring Me the Horizon is again, the same thing. Like they can write super heavy stuff and then still be played on all these radio stations where you're like, do you know what other music they play? And it's fucking amazing. Like, I, I think it's incredible yeah. that like a band could be so transcendent. Yeah, no, it's, there's some good bands out there. Um, and, you know, and they're not super new, you know, they're, 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 they're kind of new to me because I, I haven't always listened to them, but, um, yeah, still it just making seems, music. Yeah. It's it seems, still making music. Seem, it seems fresh to me. I mean, uh, architects, I think they're really great. Uh, I, I think Gojira is great. Um, heavy as fuck. Bad, bad omens. They're great. Spirit box. There's some great, just newer bands uh too so it's nice to hear where you hear new stuff and you're like wow this revived my because there's i find like there's so much there's like times and again there's so much good music being made but it's just like how do you consume it but there's like there feels like there's times where there's like nothing good coming out and then you hear a band like spirit box and you're like wow this is like refreshingly original obviously derivative of a lot of the things that i love but in a way where it's like representing that now and it's it's current and it's like it you know even a curmudgeon like me that doesn't listen to new music i'm like this is good like i take a a mental note i'm like all right all right yeah no same same here i mean same with movies you know there'll be like no good movies coming out and then Mm -hmm. then you know something good will come out yeah Uh, well for me i love that's one thing i love about touring with other bands or doing festivals is for me i think live is when i discover some of my favorite music you know, because you love sitting side stage or something you're like, oh, this song is great. I'm going to tomorrow. I'm going to go out and watch that song, you know, because yeah. for me, I find it hard. You go on Spotify or something unless I hear something on the radio or I Shazam it in a club or whatever. I mean, it's I find it hard to discover new music, you know, so mm-hmm. live and touring and festivals. That's that's a great place where I hear people and I become a fan immediately, you know, for sure. So we got, we got just a couple minutes left, but I'm curious, uh, being surrounded by music, especially when you're on a tour, uh, uh, is there any point where you need to step away and like not listen to, to music, like you know, yes. to podcasts or books <laughs> or something like that? Or, yes. or silence? <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes uh, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I go anywhere like in public, like a restaurant or something, and there's like music playing, my mind just starts analyzing the chord progressions and, uh-huh. and, and like, <laughs> totally. and it, it really bugs the shit out of me. Um, Cause yeah, yeah. I, I find that that'll happen sometimes. Plus, um, you know, when I come home from a tour, um, if, 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 if it's gotta be like somebody, a, a band that I really like, in order to go see a show. Otherwise I'm like, no, I'm like, I'm good. I don't want to go to any shows or I'm good at just, I'm just good at just hanging. But, uh, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. sense. Like, you know, when it, when it, for free, you get paid to do, you know, (laughs) plus just, just, you know, uh, it's like, that's that's my world. Yeah. I'm like, that's my world. I'm like, David uh, Copperfield ain't going to the other magicians on the strip, bro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it makes sense. You gotta, you gotta kind of have, you know, life outside of of music every now and then. Um, but listen, uh, thanks, thanks for hanging with us, Keith. It's been, it's been awesome. And uh, you know, thank you, Siobhan, for connecting us, and, and thank you for Sorry, showing I was up. Late thanks, for yeah, part thanks for one. showing up. Thanks for showing up. We appreciate it. <laughs> I know Keith Waking is probably up is like, half oh the my- battle. He's like, she baited me, and now she's not even going to show up. I like. Sent I him thought the same like, thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we talking to? That um, I, uh, Corey, when Siobhan had to sign off, that like, uh, was it Chris? Like uh, from Sabotage? No, you uh, had was, to sign off because your leg oh, was no, busted. Who, no, yeah. Okay, that. Was, but who did we talk to that like after Siobhan signed off, we felt bad because he's like, you no, could it tell was, he it wanted was, to be. It was Gary Holt, I think. 
Oh, yeah. yeah Gary yeah, Holt was yeah. so polite with us, but then after Siobhan got off, he was like, oh, yeah, I'm losing so much patience for this. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I don't blame him. I don't blame him, but like he, you could just tell he was just like, oh, well, where's like the pretty smart girl? Yeah, stuck with us. <laughs> but, stuck uh, with us doofuses. I like Slayer. You're great. Listen, guys, check out uh, KeithWallen.com. I'm looking at the tour dates now. He's got he's got everything posted there. You're going out. Uh, you got some international stuff coming up later this year, which is pretty cool. Just announced uh, a, a VIP experience, which is uh, we're calling it an eat and greet, where basically you just come hang out with me and we just have like a party and <laughs> it's like an eighth grade pizza party. <laughs> that sounds like a star set VIP. <laughs> yeah, or, or, a, or a, you know, not eighth grade, fifth grade. Yeah. Well, hold on, but this is a this is a good thing that you actually mentioned because I'm actually interested in this because back in the day bands didn't have to like you went to the stage door you didn't fucking meet Ozzy dude like you didn't get a picture yeah. with Kiss like you didn't get to stand next to Mick Jagger even for fifty grand like that didn't fucking happen mm -hmm. now especially with COVID do you feel like every band has to do this to make like additional revenue that to pay for gas maybe. I mean, who knows? I, I can't speak for everybody, but I mean, um, it's just another opportunity to kind of meet people more, you know, intimately that you probably wouldn't get the chance to just in, in a loud venue setting with all kinds of, you know, stuff happening and, you know, loud music playing. So I think it's just cool. It's a cool way to kind so of, it's uh, a cool thing. I think so. I think so. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, you don't get to, personally thank your fans mm -hmm. um in a one-to-one -one or a one-on-one -on -one kind of like basis like that even though it's like hopefully well hopefully there'll be more than one person there but uh <laughs> um you know so it's I, I look at it like that it's it's a cool way uh for me to just hang out and meet people and and say thank you for being here and for listening to my music so yeah man well we wish you the best of luck That's on the awesome. tour um yeah and i'm so bummed i'm not going to be able to see any i looked at all the dates i was like yeah. is there one day we're in the same place and then, no. <laughs> yeah i was looking uh, yeah, you're not coming anywhere uh, in the northeast now but hopefully at some point you know you do and, and when you come around we'll definitely come out and uh and check you out definitely looking forward I would love to that. hearing the stuff i would love that thank you thank you so much for for having me y'all uh no keith thank I really you i really it. really appreciate it i was like oh it'd be so great to talk to you so i sent him sent Keith a message and he said yes. So unfortunately I was late for the first one, but here we are. <laughs> we got some great insight into your life and your career, which was awesome. I think everyone's gonna really appreciate yeah. your story. It was great. And awesome. uh, we'll have we'll have all the links uh, to your social media and your website and everything in the description below. And uh, best of luck on the tour, guys. Check it out. And yeah, go, go to, to his show dates. Go go yeah. check him out De on tour. Definitely yes. hope you come to Boston, man. I'd love to hang hang out and shake your hand and and and, and pick your brain, man. It's really nice to hear again uh, the process, hearing other songwriters and and seeing the success and and, and hearing like maybe the not so much success and i think anybody like if you're like trying to trudge through stuff like just go back and listen to the two hours that uh, i appreciate you man like i really oh, do dude, I, I appreciate yeah no it uh and, and and all that stuff makes you appreciate uh you know just the journey and and you know you get to a point where you try to have a little bit of success and you just don't take it for granted for for all those reasons you know because the tough ones the tough times so Absolutely. anyway i i could talk about that shit all day and the struggle <laughs> no but, but i appreciate uh, your positivity yeah, appreciate it's, it's great you, to have your spirit uh, and that you're out there being a part of the solution as you said make, giving people the escape that they need and everyone needs more people like you and mu music making in general so you know props to you for keeping it going even when you're off tour with ben you're off doing your solo thing and and spreading the music as far and wide as you can right on well, thanks trying yeah. <laughs> check out uh, 2020-d.com you can check out part one with keith if you've subscribe. not already checked it out subscribe and we will see you guys next week wow. you know um so he, we don't we we have a no pyro rule we don't do pyro <laughs> we did it metallica not, has taught us is there, is there a story behind that there must yeah. be a story here <laughs> okay now i like nickelback i think they make great records i have nothing against them but we did an outdoor show in the, and nickelback went on it was us stone temple pilots and nickelback nickelback mm -hmm. went on in the middle of the afternoon sunny california days 90 degrees out and they've got the pyro going off and it's <laughs> it's like oh my and gosh they, and they're using pyro in the middle of the afternoon people right. are like sun tanning yeah <laughs> and, uh, and billy says we're never going to use pyro <laughs> it's not for us <laughs>